Good evening, everyone. Welcome to panel five of the six panel US Solutions Summit. I'm Andy Kennedy, co host of the morning show Hair of the Dog with Carrie Barber. The last message I got on my phone before this went live was plug the show, plug the show. So there you go. I'm also the uh, executive producer of the podcast Macro and Cheese and the video and podcast uh, series called uh, The New Untouchables of Pecorophiles. I am also the media lead of Real Progressives, Real Progress and Action. Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. We are here to talk about direct action versus political politics, election security and integrity, chain of custody, and whether the US is able to ever go back to handmark ballots again. I'm joined with four people this evening. First of all, Daniel Lupker. Hey. Say hello, Daniel. Hey, everyone. Please let us know what you do. Oh, yeah. So I run Hardlands Media 99 Perspectives. A lot of you probably have seen me and Kit on Hardlands. We do a daily show at 5 p.m. Central Time every weekday, and we do a lot of content and a couple other things on the side. Which is a perfect segue into my next guest. Who is the person you were just talking about? Kit Cabello. Good evening, Kit. How are you this evening? Uh, I'm having a wonderful time. It's nice in Chicago. It's not freezing, and it's very good to be part of this panel. I am one of the uh, co-founders of Hard Lens Media. I'm the director of communications at 99 Perspectives. I also occasionally co-host uh, Chicago Corner, which is another one of our YouTube channels, and uh, I'm also one of the <clears throat> field reporters for Hard Lens Media. Um, what we're doing in the city is something that has been seen before, and we are very honored and very happy be part of this panel and fight for that better future that's long overdue for all of us. Thank you very much, sir. As well, we are joined this evening by Craig Pasta Jardula of the famous Convo Couch. Good evening, Pasta. Good How evening. are you? Thank you for having me on, my man. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And now, last but not least, Mr. Bruno Franco. Franco, would you please explain to our audience what uh, your function is and uh, how you reach people? What's up, everybody? I'm the host of Frank Analysis. Uh, I host uh, panel discussions, interviews. I do solo videos. Um, you can find me on Twitter at B43Franco, and I'm also on Rockfin Odyssey, and I'm on YouTube still, although I don't know for how much longer. <laughs> Craig, we could talk about that too later if you'd like. Oh yeah. <laughs> can we scream about it? Can we yell about yeah. it? Yes, yes, yeah, you okay. can. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but as most Zoom calls go, please mute your microphone before you start to scream. Got it. We'll wait. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, anyways, um, let's get this discussion started. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that I'm kind of a last minute um, substitution as host for this. So I don't really have anything prepared, although I'm fairly uh, uh, cognizant of the problems and what we're about to talk about. But that allows me to allow my guests to do most of the talking, which if you ask my wife, that's a good idea. Um, direct action versus electoral politics. The United States has gone through, and I'm not just talking about the pandemic, a rather tumultuous five years. It was certainly an interesting thing to watch from north of the border with my box of popcorn. But um, I would like to start the discussion with how things have changed in terms of the left since, let's say, Bernie Sanders announced his candidacy in 2016 to now what we're seeing. Do you want to start? Uh, how about, Franco, do you want to start? How things have changed. Um, well, we're seeing a lot more independent media. We see a lot more people criticizing these politicians that aren't doing their jobs. 
Um, but what I want to discuss first is, you know, my colleagues are obviously doing a great job diagnosing the problems, but I just want to give some criticisms here. Um, my criticisms on independent media and how it will urgently, it urgently needs improve, to improve to help guide people in the most effective way forward. Uh, my criticisms will go beyond the obvious grifters and synthetic leftists like TYT, Majority Report, and the like who still tell people to support and vote for the Democratic Party. Uh, these criticisms will focus on our allies who know that simply voting for the lesser of two evils, the Democrats, is not the solution. Uh, to my colleagues in independent media, please don't take these criticisms personally because I say this so that we can all improve and reach our goals of overthrowing the current system much faster and more efficiently. My first criticism of my allies in independent media is to stop focusing so much on electoral politics, which includes uplifting third parties. Electoral politics is a waste of energy because our elections are privately owned and we need to get to the bottom of how corrupt it is and inform all people about it. I will let Pasta elaborate more on the corruption of our election system since he is the election integrity activist here. Um, however, I will say that all current third parties are a waste of time because none of them address nor initiate a mass movement against our corrupt election system and are too hyper-focused on elections. This is not to say that we cannot still vote for third parties, especially locally, but uplifting them as a center focus of our job as commentators and activists will just create false hope and wasted energy since our election system is designed to make it impossible for third parties to win elections. Such false hope is akin to making people believe that voting for progressives will help reform the Democratic Party. It's impossible because of the pressure in Congress by the corporate politicians and others who influence them and who influence our election system. Our focus should be on opting out of the system and public organizing, which I will get into in my third criticism. But very briefly, I want to mention the two biggest parties the leftist channels are focusing on. The first one is Movement for a People's Party. I've covered my criticisms of Movement for a People's Party extensively. You can tune into my channel and you'll find several videos I did about them. I even discussed this with several people who still support Movement for a People's Party, so it's not just one-sided. Um, the Green Party is the other party. They have their own elections that are rigged. Their primaries were arguably more corrupt than the Democrats' primaries. They were rigged in favor of the lackluster and hopeless Howie Hawkins. It almost seemed like they wanted to lose. They don't care about the rigged elections either. Uh, this was covered extensively by Primo Nutmeg, Nico House, Slow Newsday, and myself with interviews with several former and current Green Party members and presidential candidates like Ian Schlackman, Richard Idris, Dario Hunter, and uh, Chad Wilson. And given everything we learned about the failure of the Green Party and rigged primaries in favor of Howie Hawkins, I got to say, I'm not, I'm not proud of being in the same solution summit with him. Um, so yeah, I got to be honest there with that. And my second criticism of independent left media is that we need to focus more on exposing the hijacked nonprofit grassroots organizations like the DSA, the Sunrise Movement, 350.org. A lot of us already do a lot of exposing of the Justice Democrats, but we should focus more on other organizations that are not low-hanging fruits. Uh, leaving these controlled opposition and synthetic left organizations unexposed leads to well-meaning activists to waste their time helping the predator class that they're supposed to be fighting against. I mean, we have Bill Gates, George Soros, and others with ties to several nonprofits and 501c4s that activists join. Um, there are several investigative journalists like Corey Morningstar, Whitney Webb, and Robbie Yeager who expose these ties. We can bring, we, we can bring them on more. Uh, to inform our growing audience so that they do not waste time with these organizations that are just tools by and for the predator class um, to make people think that progress is being made when really nothing is being fixed other than tweaks around the edges. Um, so I've already said a lot during this turn. I can get to my third criticism after, but I want to give my other colleagues here a chance to speak. Okay, well, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Kit, uh, question for you. We've seen um, a real division on the left with for th force the vote, right? That started with Jimmy and um, it, it really made some 
interesting arguments back and forth about specifically the squad. What's your take on all of that? And is there an electoral politics um, way forward to, well, well first, to get it fair? Let's, let's address what force to vote was and the opportunity that was lost. You see, okay. force to vote was a correct method because the thing is, Jimmy Dore didn't just wake up overnight and just say, hey, I got an idea and got all his friends together to do it. He found it and it was in the DSA playbook. It's their idea. They're the ones that have it. And also National Nurses United has also talked about it as well. Now, the thing is, what a lot of people might forget or overlook, but at one small point, when force of vote was still in its infancy, even I was surprised that Jimmy Dore was asking AOC and certain other progressive members in the House to take it up. But the traction it was gaining is that this is a right thing to do because it shines a light on our heartless politicians, both Democrat and Republican, that they are not going to give a single payer health care at the height of a pandemic, that they're not even going to vote for it. And the thing is, is that even Jenk Uger of TYT and Sammy Boy Cedar at one small point agreed with force to vote until something happened. And we can theorize what happened, maybe ego, maybe pride, or maybe they got a phone call or whatever. Eventually there became, there became a bigger divide in the left. And the thing is this cannibalism that we're seeing on the left, to Franco's point, which he already pretty much said everything that needed to be said about the cannibalism of the left and why we need to start being critical of a lot of these larger institutions that this is going to be playing out and it has to play out in order for there to be some kind of clarity because we have to know who are the people who are on the right side of history. Force to vote is the correct method. And I agreed with Jimmy Dore's force to vote. And I know this might make other people angry, but I agreed with Jenk Uber's force to vote for 15. But my only criticism of that was, okay, Jenk, when they fail, what are you going to do? Because when it comes down to electoral politics, so long as we have people going into the Democratic Party or even in the Republican Party, they're still part of the two-party system that is owned by the top 1%. Now, the thing is, I have seen examples of electoral politics work, but at the state and city and municipal level. At the federal level, I think a lot of us are focused on the federal level. It can work in lower tier elections, like running for city council or maybe a state or house representative seat. And it gives their take, and it's a give and take in the different states and how each one of them has election integrity. But the bigger picture is that we don't have election integrity. So we could say, well, in 2022, if we get more Democrats, if we get more Democrats in the United States House and Senate, well, then maybe now we could use force to vote. When Jimmy Dore was proposing force to vote, that was a time to act. That is when decisions need to be made. And that's where the activist community has to start putting more pressure on the people that they respect. And I think the biggest problem that the left has is that we do hero worship our politicians more so than the, than the GOP or conservatives. And so if there is going to be another force to vote, potentially maybe independence, but again, at a third party level, at the federal level, it's impossible really for third parties to get in a seat because each state has its own rules and regulations of what a third party candidate has to do to get in the seat. What's needed is a groundswell of a massive movement, people, a general strike. The problem with that is I think people are burnt out. 2016 and 2020 did a number on the activist community and this division on the left, unfortunately is gonna have to continue to play out until people get their heads on straight and realize that if we don't come together, if we don't put aside our ego and pride, nothing will fundamentally change. So force the vote, again, it, it was an opportunity lost. We can imagine what it would be like if we didn't see that divide. But see, the thing about social media, and this is the poison of Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and that is people love the drama. People like seeing the fighting. Um, it's a waste of time, and nothing gets done. Now, I know that each of us have every right to be critical. Look, I'm open to criticism. I'm open for, hey, you didn't cover this story right. Or, hey, I think you guys are wrong on this issue. Okay, I will be an adult and listen to what somebody has to say, say, say it to me, speak it out to me, and explain X, Y, and Z about what is wrong. But until we have more people, especially in the activist community, groups, people, actually willing to sit down and communicate and have a real effective battle plan, I can't see how really either a ground movement or electoral politics will play out unless people start actually start coming together. 
And unfortunately, with this division that we're seeing was the aftermath of Jimmy Dore's force to vote because that was a force to vote that mattered. I don't think anything might happen at this point in time unless there is maybe another fire to get people united again. But right now you have different parties, different factions in the left, each believing that they are in the right. And the thing is, we are all concerned about what lies down the road for us in 2022 and going into 2024 with rumors of Trump running again. Because if we want to fight for progressive issues, progressives are going to have to challenge the Democrats, challenge the rules that are preventing third parties, and challenge a system that's been oppressing us for far too long. I think I, if there's anything else you want me to clarify, I'll just let you know. Oh, that's good. I, I appreciate that. Um, well, you the go point back I. Four minutes and start over again. I, I, I that's right where. All right, that was a bad joke. I said, can you go back four minutes, kid? All right, buddy. <laughs> Hey, you know, lay off me. I seriously, I I thought you were mad at us for a second, Craig. I I thought you were getting angry. I I, I said, what did we do? Pasta to sweetheart. (laughs) Thank you, Franco. (laughs) I appreciate that. (laughs) Okay, well, Craig, you spoke up. So the next question for you is now when we talk about the essence of democracy, which seems to have been lost, right, in not just the United States, but United States is the test case, right? That when you think about your district sends a representative of that district to Washington to be your spokesperson, that our system couldn't be farther from that right now. Would you agree with that? 1000% uh, because people haven't really uh, label the problem, right? You know what I'm saying? They had to, to present a solution. You first got to recognize the problem and the problem is corruption, right? And a lot of leftists think they can just vote corruption out. You can't, you got to show up at, at corruption's door and, and let them know that they're being corrupt and call them out. Uh, and that is the problem. My head almost exploded today when I was watching some of the solution summit and hearing people saying, when it comes to election, we just got to try harder. We got to knock on doors. You know what I'm saying? We got to mm-hmm. we got to virtue signal more. No, you have to call out the elections for what they are. The corruptions that th- that's there. And then, you know, one of the guests just said before, too, as well, what are you going to do? How are you going to change the system electoral if you have the same people in there? Well, first off, like I said, acknowledge the problem. Our elections are a sham. They're some of the worst elections around. We have proprietary software tabulating 99% of our votes in our publicly funded elections. That means it's a secret software. You can't look at it even though you pay for it. So whatever goes in might not necessarily be the result coming out. So if you're wondering why our elected representatives, elected representatives, I call them selected representatives, never go with the will of the people is because they're going with the will of the people who put them there, the overlords, the tech geniuses, whoever's pulling the strings. And I think we have to start acknowledging that as the problem and have a plan in place to fix it. For instance, the first thing that should be done is when any candidate run and any had any of those three candidates that were on before uh, that are going to run for Democrats. First of all, I don't even know why you're going to run in a corrupt system and a corrupt party. Anyways, if you're not a Democrat, don't run as a Democrat. We have to stop doing this lesser of two evil bullshit to try to get in, in office. But what you should be doing is right out of the gate, as soon as your election's over, you should having all your followers and everybody who's with your campaign start going for record request. OK, you have to you have to write in record requests for everything about that election, every piece of data for that election you can get. You got to get a hold of it because then you can start to point out the problems that lie within our elections if you have that da- data. But instead, what do progressives do? Oh, it was me. I didn't knock on enough doors. I didn't call enough people. I didn't do blah, 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 blah. No. Call out the corruption. Stop running with corruption. Stop thinking you're going to vote out the corruption. And let's start the process of individual responsibility of going in and finding the data for these elections, requesting this data so we can expose the problem at hand. What's happening in Arizona right now is is a shame that the, the Democrats are not aboard with this. Not even so much the Democrats, the progressives, you know, the ones that in 2016 that were in the courtroom when uh, the Democratic lawyer, Bruce Spiva, stood up and said, listen, the Democratic Party can go into the back room filled with cigar smoke and pick whoever we want. Well, if that isn't corruption in your face, what is? I mean, they're pretty much telling you that a democratic process doesn't have to be democratic. So we have to first start educating ourselves on elections, understand how elections run. Remember what Stalin said. It's not those who cast the vote that have power. It's those who count the votes. And in America, 
99% of your elections are counted by secret proprietary software. We need to start changing it, getting a plan in place and start calling it out for what it is. And the Democratic Party is not that party. Sorry. Well, no, I, I agree with you completely. And one thing I will tell you as a Canadian, and I've pretty much voted in every single election that I could because I believe in the process here, at least here in Canada. But every single election that I have voted for, I was given a piece of paper. I wrote my choice on the paper. I handed it to the election official and they put it in the ballot box. Every single one, including the last ones, which were just a couple of years ago. There's never been an electronic part to that process. Well, that right. you, can, you can either go either way. If you want to have a system where tabulation machines are going to be used, you have to have an open source system. And then you can have a 100% hand-counted audit behind it. But whatever the case is, whatever you decide to go with, whether you're marking it with hand, whether you're using a ballot marking device, you know what I'm saying? It has to be transparent across the board. And that's what, what I'm talking about right there. That's just two parts of the election. you got to look at it as, as a poker game. There's four, four of the places where the overlords, the tech lords, can cheat you and put their person in power. So, yes, that is one way. We have to understand elections as a whole. So you can say we need ranked choice voting or we need uh, funding, you know what I'm saying, put more public funding. We have to combat the the evil parts of HR one, which allows the corporate duopoly to raise unlimited amounts of money while suppressing smaller votes. We have to change the framework of our elections. My partner says that we don't need reform. We need election revolution. So it starts with us learning. And let me tell you something, the Republicans, the Patriots, the, or the Trump fans, or whatever they call themselves, they're kicking progressives butts. Instead of us digging into these elections in 2016, we stomped our feet a little bit and then we thought we can go vote out corruption. It's not going to work that way. Don't join corruption. Don't think you're going to vote it out. Face it. Face on. Get in its face and let it know that corruption's there. We won't abide by it. And we're going to check every aspect of these elections. And we're going to learn every aspect of these elections. Because it might be just Donald Trump this time that might have got cheated. But it's always the grassroots candidates. And these guys in Chicago can tell you because they follow elections too. It's the grassroots candidates. And same thing here in L.A., and they get it on the nose. Those are the people who get cheated constantly. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, for going off. Franco got yeah. me all riled up. It's OK. It's all right. We like you riled up. It's fine. Gotcha. It's but now I, I would like Daniel. I would like Daniel to weigh in because he hasn't spoken yet. But I'd like to talk to Daniel about direct action. Let's talk about direct action. What do you think would be effective direct action in today's yeah. society? Okay, so I think that there's a lot of things that I want to build on what everyone else has said so far. First, we have starting with indirect action. We have a lot of things that have to go into even getting to that question. I think that question is almost too advanced from where we're at right now. First, to build on other people, the fact that the left is fighting itself yet again, as it always does, is an enormous issue. We know that there are people that are not part of the left, and they're obviously doing the wrong thing. We call out TYT all the time on the show. But I feel that we overdo heavily how much we fight each other. But I also see why we do. It's a natural sort of ecological system that happens when people that are outside of power are trying to get it. Just a feudal system. That's all it is. It's just little tiny kingdoms fighting for power, even though if they combined their efforts, even if they didn't fully agree on everything, they would actually be able to do something. But we're here still pulling that feudal system and making it sound like it works. Um, then we have, just in terms of elections, we don't have the power to really have any influence on this right now. And I feel that we lost, we get so stuck in just viewing what's wrong with the system. Although, to add on what everyone else says, it's a disaster. It's a mess. There's no question about it. But we're in a position as progressives right now that if we call out any person in office, they can literally just slough it off and go, that is literally irrelevant to my life. We could get our friends and go protest at a outside of some politician's house, they're going to wait a week. We're going to go away at some point. The problem that we have is that we don't have the ability to act continuously. Here's an example. So me and Kit were part of Wolfpack. We got our stuff done in a year. We got 20 people. We were able to get one of the most corrupt states to pass an anti-corruption bill. The reason that worked is that there were a number of people and any time these type of events happen you always need like three or four let's say four people that you have to pay full time to spend their time 
running these organizations. If you pay someone a, a fifteen dollar wage, it's about thirty five thousand dollars a year times four. It's seventy thousand, one hundred forty thousand. You have to rent a space. You have to have stuff that you have to use. That's a two hundred thousand dollar a year expense to be able to continuously employ and operate fifty to one hundred volunteers to make an action work. Which, by the way, is what the Democrat and Republican Party are able to do all the time. Now, what we know from experience, we know from grassroots elections, is you need like a tenth of the time as a grassroots person that's actually speaking on behalf of people in their own interests to get them to agree with you as people have to spend millions of dollars in TV ads, not knocking, to get people to somewhat go, yeah, 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 I guess that makes sense. So we know that we have that advantage in that point. But to do that, we actually have to build real infrastructure. I talk about this in Hardlands every now and then, but it's very important to remember. Right now, everyone that's on this panel has taken – time and energy and brings in income to be able to talk to thousands of people every single day. That's an example of that working, but we only talk and we need to do a lot more. We need to be able to, we talk about co-ops all the time. We talk about how we need to get other companies to do it. We need to lead. I think a big issue that we have is in a sense, it's very much like the perception of the Green Party. If people think you're not going to do anything, even if they think you might do better than the people they're currently voting for, they're not going to vote for you because they don't have any confidence that you're going to exist. So we need to lead all of this by our own actions. We need to get together. We need to make co-ops. We talk about not liking the banking system. We need to make institutions, financial institutions ourselves, credit unions and the like that actually do this. If we can't do this ourselves, then how can we really – how can people that don't already agree with us think, oh, yeah, those guys, that what they're saying is good and I can trust what they're going to do? That's not how it's going to work. We already have the people that already agree with us already agree with us, but it's clearly not enough, and it clearly is not going to convince people to do what we want. The way we change that is we have to build outside of just media. That's one thing we're doing at Hard Lens Media. We're actually – we have a thing called 99 Perspectives. We built it at the start with Hard Lens Media for this exact reason because – we, I mean, we saw enough of TYT to know that even though with the size that they're at, it really didn't matter. They couldn't even get an election that they got more than 2 or 3% on. And that's quite pathetic, but they didn't have a ground game. The thing that we did, the only thing that we did connected to that was, was Wolfpack was a ground game, and it did work. But to do that, you have to be able to maintain it. I don't care if we can take one punch metaphorically at a politician putting a bad bill. It's irrelevant. It never matters. They wait it out a week, and then they keep doing what they're doing. You know what does change it? When every single day for a full year there are people outside their house, outside their office, uh, connecting with newspapers and having people that are paid enough to focus on that. If we're just going to sit here and be on uh, news and just talk about it, we're never going to accomplish anything, and especially if we're not going to build anything. If we're just going to fight people that we disagree with at some points, I, we personally think, at least with Hard Lens, we decided not to do that. We think it's a waste of energy. If you see someone that's not doing anything useful, let them not do something useful. We're going to take them back by getting the people that are with them to see that there's a better avenue. If we can't do these things and really start building something that we can sustainably – attack the people again metaphorically that we're trying to overturn i don't know how we could possibly think we can succeed it doesn't matter what the voting system is if you have enough people that are angry enough and are going to vote a certain way at some point they're going to not be able to deal with it we're talking enormous margins that we aren't even capable of doing right now we're talking getting people so upset at people that we have the power I want to be in a position for every single progressive media that when we call out a politician, they fear it versus ignore it. Right. Exactly. Now, Kit, do you agree with that? Do you uh, <clears throat> agree that that it's going to be a, a coming together on this on the uh, on the media side, on the independent media side that could make a difference? Uh, if in the, well, again, we're all seeing the, the fighting that's happening on social media. I don't know what that coalition looks like, but it is the most effective pathway for at least all of us to put aside our differences and try and get to a real goal. And that is educating people about the failures of our economic system, of our political system, of our voting system. So we're going to have to come together. And to Daniel's point, again, it's about building coalitions and actually trying to build something sustainable. Do it right the first time. And we've seen the failures of these larger institutions and our politicians. It's time to push that aside 
and do something correct. Because for a long time, corporate media, the political establishment has been giving us their narrative. We see that it doesn't work. And our problem right now is on the left is that we are too divided. We are infighting way too much. And we have to build proper political, economic, social infrastructure for independent media and for the activists and community organizers so that things can fundamentally change. Because if we don't start doing something now, who knows what we're looking at 10 years down the road? We, we got to step up. But again, what that coalition or even what's going to set it off for people to come together, I don't know. Craig, how big a problem is cancel culture right now? It's the biggest problem, which kind of leads to my uh, to, to piggyback a little bit what on Kit says, because I don't even know what left means anymore. Right. You know what I'm saying? We're here at the solution summit and it looks like we got four leftists, I guess, talking together without talking to somebody on the right. Right. As well, because that's to me is the, the big problem is that we are too tribal and we're, we're worried about coming together with things, people on the left, because that's what we're labeled with, not rather than talk to people who have, you know, common ground with us on the right. You know what I'm saying? That's why I have a lot of Republicans on my show. We're trying to talk to a lot of conservatives because I do think differently than them, but where can we come together? Where can we find common ground? And I think that's a big thing. Cal cancel culture is a tactic that's set up by the predator class or whoever's running things, whoever you want to label them, the deep state, whatever you want to call them, we call them the predator class. It's a tactic that is, is put there to, to further the divide and conquer mentality that's plagued us here in the United States and stuff like that. If we're fighting with each other, then we're not paying attention to what's upstairs and what's going on and who's really co controlling us. And that's something we need to do. So for me, it's about talking to dissenting voices or not. You know what I'm saying? People who think differently than than us. Not, uh, but the problem is it's the tribalness is kind of highlighted and the cancel culture is out there. And instead of just pointing fingers at each other, maybe we should go, hey, let's get that opinion from that guy over there. He might not be for Medicare for all. He might not be for climate control like I am and stuff, but maybe we'll agree on elections. Maybe we'll agree on civil liberties and stuff because we say we're leftists, but everything's turned upside down. The left is now taking on all the culture wars and their own frame that the Republicans did in the 80s and 90s. Remember, you can't burn a flag. You can't kneel over here. You got to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, there's no abortion allowed whatsoever. And now the the Democrats are are the leftists. They're all about they got this little authoritarian mentality. Oh, I don't like that speech. Let that be censored because that's that's bad. My wokeness says shut that person out. Cancel that person. Don't even talk to that person. He's a Nazi because he freaking voted for Trump. And these tactics, it, it, it's just crazy if you pay attention to them. So that's why I say, what is even the left anymore or the right anymore? I think in a frame, a, a frame of populism, and I know some people don't like that word, but I like it. It's what the populism wants. You know what I'm saying? That's the things we need to concentrate on. And if we all got in the room, right, you know, we got rid of these jerk offs up top that are running things. We brought out the guillotine or do it Mussolini style. We can all then get in a room together and decide what's best for all of us to make sure we can work out our differences and move along amicably and, and really just change everything that's going on in this world today. But it's calling out corruption for what it is because it happens on the left just as much as it happens on the right. And that's something we got to change. Yeah, just, absolutely. Just to throw in one thing on that. Cancel Please. culture is just cultural authoritarianism. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, eventually those, that, and, and those that do cancel culture eventually get canceled themselves because again, Cancel culture is nothing but cannibalism. And again, look, look at everything that they're complaining about. It's just, it's far too similar to what we see, to Craig's point, uh, to what we saw in the 80s with conservatism. It's just, it never works. And eventually no one's going to care. Yeah. And just to remind everyone, I think as much as that we had a lot of failures with Bernie running, uh, those, two, we now are winning on the issues. I mean, like, even corporate media has gone way past the point of going, well, yeah, everyone agrees with Bernie, but if you word it this weird way, they all, no, but we already know that we've already won on the issues. So the point is now we just need a fraction of the power of the people we're fighting. We don't need to match them even close. They're a teetering empire. We already know America is a crumbling empire, falling apart, acting more illogical as time goes on. We just need to build and sustain a wrench to keep throwing it into their machine and keep showing people that we are a better alternative. Because at some point, whether it's through us, whether it's through someone else, whether it's through natural collapse, there's going to be a power vacuum. And we want to be the people that people come to because they believe in us, they believe we can succeed, 
and we already won. To go with literally, this is all this is politics is war. It's quote Sun Tzu: a victorious army wins and then goes to war. A defeated army goes to war first and then seeks to win. We need to stop being so reactionary. Part of the way we show reactionary cancel culture, but really it's just reacting to whatever's going along. We need to be proactive. We need to take action. We need to plan. We need to have our own plans that other people have to react to. We need to be at a time where that can happen. Just as a quick example, in the very early days of Hardlands Media, we were not national. We did local coverage. We never were able to actually make it sustainable. That's why we shifted to national coverage. But when we were local, we were on the ground all the time and talking to a lot of people. And I can tell you, we got dozens of people to volunteer for campaigns for aldermen that ended up winning by 100 votes out of several thousand. We can take credit in Chicago for four elections with uh, – granted, it is DSA, but nonetheless, we were able to get some really terrible aldermen out of office. One and, that, and that's because we had a sustained ground force and coverage and who we were connecting with, and we had – even though it was small, it's a very, very connected audience. And so in a lot of, some ways, even though we have way more people watching us on Hardlands in the current setup, I feel we were more effective with a smaller audience dealing in Chicago because I think people forget we, we, we're, we're national channels. All of us are national channels. We talk about national politics. But we have, like the kids point earlier, we have a lot of ability to affect local stuff. If you affect enough local stuff, eventually you can shift and affect state stuff. You get enough state stuff, you can shift and affect national stuff. We're, Craig's right. The way that everything voting doesn't work. So we have to take over it piece by piece at the lowest scale, which again means we have to be able to sustain efforts for years. Great. Good point. Uh, by the way, if I can interject too, I mean, also look at how crazy, like again, with small scale elections, like city council seats. Let's say, for example, just how the establishment is afraid of Kashama Sawant, for example. In her re-election bid, Amazon was supporting her, her opponent, giving like millions of dollars to his campaign. And even now, Kashama Sawant is still at risk of losing her city council seat by the, by the state of Washington. And it's, it's, it's rather a frightening, this, or it, it, and it should also motivate us to at the same time that the establishment is afraid of when we start shaking their system apart. And at the local level, there's a lot of power that we can do, and it's long overdue that we actually use it. And I've seen it happen in 2019 in Chicago for the municipal election cycle. It, it can be done. It's just, it's, I, I think a lot of people aren't really fully aware of what can be done at the city or town or state level. Right. Okay. Great point. Uh, Franco, do you want to weigh in with your, your the third point? Uh, yeah, I've been waiting your... for the third point. Let's go. Yeah, I'll, I'll get some of the third criticism I have, and then after that, I'll I'll give some more detailed uh, uh, sure. some more I'm... details on the solutions that I have um, okay. that we can all do. But yeah, the the third criticism I have um, that I will mention is that independent media needs to step up their game, and they need to evolve rapidly just as many of their audiences are. And we need to focus more on solutions. Like we're seeing our audiences are evolving. Like they're learning a lot from us, right? We can't stay stuck simply criticizing mainstream media and politicians segment after endless segment without encouraging people to be active. Because if we, if we continue this habit of just talking about problems, uh, it becomes infotainment. And it makes audience members lazy. It makes them hopeless. It makes them feel misdirected. And what I mean by rapidly evolve is that we really need to learn what works and doesn't work at creating change most effectively, given the amount of short time that we have left. Uh, we need to enforce solutions and discuss solutions with as many other commentators, journalists, and activists as we can with different ideologies, but in agreement that the current system needs to go. I mean, we're already doing that. We're doing a lot of collaboration. We're having solution summit like this. I'm having panel discussions on my channel. Um, I encourage all in the independent media commentators and journalists to also be activists. And if you're the head of a successful network and you don't want to get involved on the ground, the least that you can do is hire people who can be on the ground. And also spending too much time criticizing mainstream media or talking about the latest gossip on Capitol Hill while not presenting solutions outside of electoral politics is this huge disservice to your audience. So let me repeat that again spending too much time criticizing, criticizing mainstream media 
or talking about the latest gossip on Capitol Hill while not presenting solutions outside of electoral politics is a huge disservice to your audience. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't like still criticize mainstream media, like, but as, if that's the only thing that you're doing on your show, like what are you leaving your audience with? They understand what the problem is. They'll understand what the problem is after two or three segments of seeing you criticize Rachel Maddow or what somebody, some schmuck said on the New York Times. But now what is the next step? What do we do going forward? So we need to grow our online communities. We need to help increase their consciousness. Not only do we need to increase their political consciousness, but we also need to teach them effective ways of how to inform more people and be more patient when they interact with people that are at different points in their political journey. I mean, there's still people that watch TYT or watch Sam Cedar. We have to be patient with those people. We were all there once. TYT was my gateway. On the ground communities need to communicate with other communities and we can get more on the ground communities because they translate from online communities. I can't tell you how many people I've seen like online on my Discord, on my YouTube, meeting each other, becoming friends with each other, sending information to each other on my Discord and finding out that they live near each other and then they organize with each other. Like I've, I've seen a DMV uh, action for Assange form because they, these people met online, they found out about events happening in different parts of the country, they all meet and then they form their own little things. Um, they form their own little events. Um, we also can't just solely rely on protests. We have to really opt out of the system. Derek Bros of the Conscious Resistance Network and from The Last American Vagabond, he's promoting a concept called Freedom Cells. Uh, this is a network for people to get together with people near them who share common goals and interests and collectively work to accomplish their goals. Franco, like learning. I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting, but um, I've just been informed we're almost out of time. I, I'm really sorry for interrupting your thing, but I just wanted to say thank you, gentlemen. This has a, been a great conversation. Daniel, Kit, Craig, Franco, I really enjoyed our talk. Um, let's keep a conversation going. And... Uh,